Conduct yourselves with reverence during the time of your sojourn sojourning, realizing that you were ransomed from your futile conduct, handed on by your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a spotless, unblemished lamb. He was known before the foundation of the world, but revealed in the final time for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs> according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. That very day, the first day of the week, two of Jesus' disciples were going to the village seven miles from Jerusalem called Emmaus, and they were conversing about all the things that had occurred. And it happened that while they were conversing and debating, Jesus himself drew near and walked with them. But their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing as you walk along? They stopped looking downcast. One of them named Cleopas said to him in reply, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know of the things that have taken place there in these days? And he replied to them, what sort of things? They said to him, the things that happened to Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word, before God and all the people. How our chief priests and rulers both handed him over to a sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping that he would be the one to redeem Israel. And beside all this, it is now the third day since this took place. Some women from our group, however, have astounded us. They were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body. They came back and reported that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who announced that he was alive. Then some of those with us went to the tomb and found things just as the women had described, but him they did not see. And he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are! How slow of heart to believe all, the prophets, all that the prophets spoke! Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them what referred to him in all the scriptures. As they approached the village to which they were going, he gave the impression that he was going on farther, but they urged him, stay with us, for it is nearly evening and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. And it happened that while he was with them at table, he took bread, said the blessing, broke it and gave it to them. With that, their eyes were opened and they recognized him, but he vanished from their sight. Then they said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he spoke to us on the way and opened the scriptures to us? 
So they set out at once and returned to Jerusalem, where they found gathered together the eleven and those with them, who were saying, the Lord, is truly have, the Lord has truly been raised and has appeared to Simon. Then the two recounted what had taken place on the way and how he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. The Gospel of the Lord. He was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Have you ever had the experience where your heart was burning inside of you because you've had a flash of insight, something that gave you a depth of understanding that you didn't have before? You see, confusion always precedes insight. And boy, when you get that insight, it's exciting. In that first reading, we hear the apostle saying, look, Jesus is fulfilling this Davidic stuff. God said that there would be this successor of David that would put all things right. And Jesus was that guy. In the second reading, we hear the apostle enjoining the people to comport themselves with reverence. My brothers and sisters, this is what our world needs more than anything else reverence. We need to reverence each other. We need to recognize our dignity and the dignity of everyone around us. And that's what will help heal our world. There was a story in the Wall Street Journal, I think it was, it came up at our men's group this morning and somebody pointed it out. And over the last 20 years, 20 years, just been just an evacuation of priorities. Like in the 90s, People thought values were important. In fact, values, if you can believe it, was more important than money. But now money has superseded values. You realize what that means? It means that most people think whatever matters to get more money doesn't matter what the value is if you can get more money. We see our culture and our society so deceived into thinking that that will lead to happiness, that that will lead to somehow satisfaction. And what will lead to happiness is an encounter with the truth. Did you ever wonder what Jesus was talking about on the road to Emmaus? Did you ever wonder what passages he was pointing to? I think a good place to start would be looking at the readings that we hear during the Easter Vigil. There's about seven of them that start off with the creation and then the deliverance of the people from their slavery and prophecies of Isaiah and Ezekiel, and all these realities that point to this truth of Jesus risen from the dead. And I mentioned on Easter Sunday the new evidence that points to the shroud. In fact, a good friend of mine has a life-size replica of the shroud, and we're going to have it up here, I think, for a couple weeks. We'll be back in the Monsignor Gaelic room with information and different things you can look at to, to check it out. But in the end, so they have all these things. And, and as I said on Easter Sunday, it's not the forensic evidence that's so compelling to me. It's the testimony of those early Christians who gave up their life lastingly because they saw Jesus tortured, killed, and risen from the dead. And they believed it. You see, it's not just about believing in God. It's about believing God. Believing what he said, what he's revealed to us in the sacred scriptures. And that is what will give us stability and something to go forward that we can latch on to that really ultimately gives life meaning because we too will rise from the dead. I can't prove it, but I'm betting my life on it. And I beg the Lord to continue to let me respond to the grace that he gives me to continue believing it because faith is a gift. It really is. If you have faith, you don't need proof. And if you don't have faith, no proof is going to be sufficient. We all have a PhD in rationalization. <laughs> we can really make excuses for whatever we want to do, and boy, are we pretty darn good at it. But if we can humble ourselves and say, Lord, lead me to your truth, not Father Glenn's truth, not the Pope's truth, but the truth, we will find happiness. But boy, 
Does it take courage to do that? Does it take courage to say, you know, somebody might understand things a little bit better than I do? That's not easy for some people, because if you do that, then you have to acknowledge the condition for the possibility of God. And that makes demands on us. See, for me, I think part and parcel of what Jesus explained as well is as he's going through salvation history, he's saying, you know, Moses, people sinned, but I forgave them. And then they wouldn't go into the Holy Land. They made this golden calf, but I gave them the commandments. And, and he forgave them after he made the golden calf, but then they wouldn't trust him. And then he had to wander in the desert for 40 years. And he instructed the people to build the Ark of the Covenant. And inside the Ark of the Covenant were three things. The Ten Commandments, the Staff of Aaron, and a cup of the manna that came down that sustained the people for 40 years. And they kept this Ark in a tent. The Latin word for tent, by the way, is tabernacle. But David wanted to build a temple, and give God a house, but he had shed too much blood, so Solomon was given the permission to build a temple and a house, and that's why they built the temple to hold the Ark of the Covenant. Recall the Samaritan woman when she said, Lord, you Jews worship on our, your mountain, we worship on ours. Who's right? And Jesus, in his customarily blunt fashion, said, sorry, honey, but salvation is from the Jews. You don't understand what you believe, but we do. And but they'll come time when you won't worship on this mountain or that mountain, but you will worship in spirit and in truth. And that's what we have today. What's in our tabernacle? We believe that it's Jesus Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity. They say only about 30% of Catholics believe that anymore. Maybe it's down even to 17%. Believe it's a symbol. But we, if you know what we believe, the bread and the wine are symbols, but they symbolize bread and wine. <laughs> they're no longer bread and wine. They symbolize that, but they're the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. And the Eucharistic miracles that God gives us to kind of bolster our faith, blood type AB, the same type they see on the shroud. Kind of cool. Universal receptor. God accepts everyone. But as I said, these miracles don't convince me because even if they were a fraud it wouldn't change my faith so in our tabernacle we have jesus and in the first chapter of john it says in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god jesus the word of god like the commandments the word of god jesus is the good shepherd what does every good shepherd need but a and Jesus in John 6, which we go over in the daily mass readings now as we go through the daily mass cycle, getting into the bread of life discourse. Jesus said, your ancestors ate manna in the desert, but they died. I am the living bread come down from heaven. The manna. So you see, we fulfill all that Old Testament covenantal worship stuff. I can't help but believe that this is what Jesus was explaining to the people that God's living and abiding presence is truly experienced in the breaking of the bread. The symbolic bread. Because the breaking of his body and blood. Amazing. It's the reason why I wear the funny clothes. This thing is the Levitical priesthood garment. The stole is the Jewish prayer shawl. And this is the outer garment the Romans wore, the lawgiver. We fulfill all this Old Testament covenantal worship stuff. It's amazing. When, through God's grace, I was able to kind of put this stuff together, it's such things that led me to forsake my life, to put my career aside, to put my plans aside, because I felt God wanted me to do this. And boy, what a grace and a gift it's been. Because when we walk with God and we struggle, even amidst our failures and weaknesses, he's with us. He gives us joy. He brings happiness to our hearts and souls. Suffering is transformed. 
There's no way to escape suffering. We all have sufferings. We all have problems. We have people who don't believe us. We have people that just maybe even hurt us. But they become transformed because we're united to this mystical body of Christ. And all that suffering is redeemed. And as we consciously unite our own sufferings with Christ, we participate in the redemption of the world. It's great to not give people power over you. And we give people power over you, over us, when we don't forgive, when we hold on to grudges, and we let someone who's outside of our purview and our daily experience still bother us. Isn't that great? To have that kind of liberty and freedom, but it's only through grace that we can do it. And it's a process. And how do we do this? By studying the scriptures, understanding what they say, living our faith, being more concerned about serving others than being served. It's the key to joy. It's the key to healing our society. Because what does our society want? It wants division. It wants us to hate each other. You know, I was talking to a gentleman on, on the pro not this property over at St. John's, and um, he was looking for some work and different things, and we had a nice conversation, and he, he felt it very important to say, you know, I'm not African. I'm some kind of strange tribe, or so I can't remember the word. And I said, you know, that's great. He said, but you know what? You and me both, we're human doesn't matter what tribe we're from doesn't matter where we come from we're human and Jesus came to save humans let not the devil divide us let us realize and rejoice in our humanity and he kind of looked at me and said you know I like you <laughs> I said great I like you too because we're not identified by ethnicity or any of that stuff but boy the devil wants to divide us let us pray that we can be uniters, that we can be healers, healers of division, that we may recognize him in the breaking of the bread. And may our hearts too burn within us when the scriptures come alive to us and we understand the depth of that revelation and the beauty of that truth. When we encounter truth, my brothers and sisters, it always fills us with joy. May we all know my master's joy. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us stand and profess our faith in the only God who can save. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. And by the Holy Spirit was incarnate the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And now we bring our prayers of intercession before the Lord. For the church, that she may proclaim the risen Christ and be an instrument of his mercy that he longs to offer to all. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. 
for all nations throughout the world that they may recognize the need for God's mercy and work for lasting peace and mutual respect for human dignity and not be motivated by greed and self-interest, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That our hearts may burn within us and we hear the, and we hear the good news of our salvation, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For Lisa Jensen, the intention of this Mass, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all the personal intentions found in our parish book and that our parish may guide families to pursue the truth and live it, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That all corruption be uncovered and those responsible for it lose their power and are replaced by leaders who respect life, religious liberty, and all that is in accord with natural law, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all the newly baptized and those who have entered into full communion with the Catholic Church throughout the world and in our parish, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all who have died, that they may come to know the fullness of God's joy in heaven, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, hear the prayers of the people gathered here before you. Those spoken and those kept in the silence of our hearts. Answer them insofar as they meet our deepest needs and are in accord with your holy and divine will. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our offertory hymn is number 460 in the one in faith, number 460. Mm -hmm. 